All right. So welcome everyone. My name is Casey. I'm a nurse and I work for Trusted Health. Uh, welcome to our event all about health insurance for travel nurses. Let's see. So thanks for joining us. I already talked about this, but please use the question function on the right hand side. You'll find the chat section and go up to the Q&A button. Click that and ask your question there. We are here to listen, learn and connect and to get inspired to learn about options for healthcare as a travel nurse. We have quite uh, an extent. We're going to talk about terminology, insurance to the, the nursing agency, healthcare alternatives outside the nursing agency, coverage between contracts and COBRA, and resources. And to kick it off, I'd love to introduce you to our first host of this evening, Ms. Lynn Freer. Hi, guys. I am a nurse. I'm also the founder of FIHealthcare.com, which is the nation's largest a uh, crowdsourced database of options for healthcare outside of work, traditional employment. It was really designed for the early retiree community. I became work optional in my late 30s, and so I was trying to figure out what we would do for healthcare, and uh, it got to be well known. And so I've been featured on the Wall Street Journal. Market Watch has made a documentary about me. I'm a very financially savvy nurse who started investing when I was 12. Uh, lost it all, lost all my investments in my late 20s because I had a brain tumor, had to learn how to walk again, had to navigate medical bills. So I got really passionate about understanding medical bills, billing, costs from the inside and from the outside. Um, my husband is a chef. I'm very lucky because I don't know how to cook at all and haven't had to learn uh, because he's so great. And two little girls, six and seven, and that's been really interesting in the pandemic with 42 Zoom meetings a week for those two. I live in the greater Seattle area. I miss Megan Burns. Hi, everyone. Uh, so great and excited to talk about benefits today. It's obviously a passion um, and so important to understand. Um, my name is Megan Burns, like Casey mentioned. I am Trusted Health Client Service Manager here at Sequoia Consulting. Um, so we're their brokerage partner. We help set up um, all of their benefit plans. Um, we partner with their carriers. Uh, we partner with Trusted to implement uh, all of the plan administration and then any types of service or claims questions that come in. Uh, I live in the Bay Area, San Francisco, uh, right on the corner of Haight and Ashbury anyone's ever been in the neighborhood, uh, but I'm currently in South Carolina visiting my family um, and had a really great 4th of July uh, at the ocean this past weekend. So yeah, really excited to uh, be here today and listen to any questions you have. So thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks, Megan. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Lynn, just so everyone's aware. We're going to start off with Lynn's presentation. Um, and do a Q&A with a short Q&A with Lynn. And then we will pass it off to Megan, who will talk about specifically trusted benefits and have um, you all the opportunity to ask her questions as well. So I am going to pass it off to Miss Lynn. All Here right. This is a disclaimer that says I'm basically not a legitimate anything with health insurance. I am. There's lots of folks out there who are and they would be happy to sell you products. I am a nurse, I'm a fellow nurse who wants to figure out this solution because I am financially geeky and early work optional. People come to me because of the website that I own and so I crowdsource information for others. So, it, you know, seek the advice of a licensed professional, um, but I am essentially a financially savvy nurse and so that's my disclaimer to tell you that. Okay, Casey teases me because I always say to pull up a cuppa. Do, do none of you do that? Is that an old saying? Am I old? I don't know if it's a regional thing, but yes, get cozy. This is about healthcare and health insurance, which when you tackle it, when you figure it out, it's very freeing, but sometimes it can be a little frustrating. So uh, get comfortable. Casey's advancing my slides for me. So first, we're going to talk about health insurance terminology, just to make sure everybody knows. So the premium is what you pay every month or every week, regardless of you using health insurance. 
So that is your, just like a gym membership, whether you go to the gym or don't, you need to pay the monthly or um, in health insurance, sometimes it's weekly. And so you pay that regardless. I, and these terms are really important to know because they're sort of the foundation for the talk. So I wanna make sure everybody knows that. The second important term is the deductible. And the deductible is the amount that you have to pay before insurance starts sharing the cost with you. So sometimes that's zero. Sometimes they start sharing right away. Sometimes with a high deductible plan, it could be 4,000, 5,000. Uh, I've seen up to 12,000 or so. It really, really varies, but basically you're self-insuring before uh, health insurance will actually start to pay with you. And your out-of-pocket max is usually higher than your deductible. And it's the amount the insurance company says that they will pay that you theoretically should pay as a maximum. So that's also a good number to keep track of. A lot of people don't meet their out-of-pocket max in a year, but that number can be pretty high. Uh, so it's good to keep an eye out for that. So the first thing, the, the things I want to talk about are health insurance through a nurse staffing agency and then health insurance outside or healthcare outside of the nursing agency. Because a lot of folks want to know about both and a lot of folks in the, the pre-RSVP questions wanted to know really what can they get outside of the agency because I think people want a lot of autonomy and options. So we're going to talk about both, but first the insurance through the nurse staffing agency. So it's pretty variable. I did a lot of research. I contacted a lot of agencies. Nurse staffing agencies are pretty elusive with what they want to tell you. I'm a hospice nurse, so I tried to leverage that. That's a pretty, um, in my experience, was, was pretty helpful to try to get information from them. So I was able to collect some data from a few different agencies. And what I found right now, as of the time of this recording in July 2021, it really does vary, but the premiums tend to range from about 50 to 120 a week, uh, and that's for the individual. The deductible ranges quite a bit, and I usually found about between zero and 5,000. So a good, and that's an annual deductible, not a monthly or weekly, of course. The good general rule is the higher the deductible, the lower the premium. Insurance companies are smart, so nothing is you know, a tremendously different deal. It's just a matter of, are you in the healthier population? Then maybe you might be willing to tolerate a higher deductible versus the other options. So here are some pros. The pros are that your HR department would be very happy to help set this up if you go through the, the agency because this is part of what they do. They do it every day. Many of the plans will be interstate, so they'll work between states. And especially if you get it through a travel nursing agency, that's designed for what they what they do. And often they have options to buy dental and vision, and I believe Trusted has that option for both of those. So those are pros, and that's not always the case with all plans. Another pro that I didn't mention is that often employers will be able to negotiate better rates because you're sort of in a group of people. The cons are that if you stop your contract with that agency, you may, you know, lose your coverage. And we'll talk a little bit about more about COBRA and what that means a little bit later, but that's a definite con. So I want people to note that. Okay, so now I think this is what a lot of people want to know. Health insurance outside of nursing agencies and what's really nice is the website I developed was for early retirees, but it's really the same problem. It's how do you navigate health insurance, healthcare costs when you're not linked to a particular employer? So one of the ways you can do that is you can work with a broker and you can get that by, usually they're sort of regional um, and they will cover a certain area and they can help decide what plans are available to you. So they're customized to your particular situation. That's a pro and they may have access to many different options and dental and vision. The cons are that a lot of times brokers will only work in certain geographic areas and they may not have action or access to all the options. And of course, because they are getting paid, they will have some sort of intrinsic bias. 
Another option for getting health care outside of an employer, this is an alternative to health insurance. It's not technically health insurance. It's called a health sharing ministry. And basically it is a pool of people who pool their money. It's almost considered a donation. It has kind of strict criteria for qualifying. And so you can be excluded for a pre-existing condition. It excludes a lot of things that are that might be for some of the religious health sharing ministries considered sinful. Um, I'm smiling because one of my friends said I, I recommended health sharing ministry as a layer for her health care and she said she was too sinful to do that. Um, so I think it can be an option for a lot of folks or as a layer on top of what they're already doing. So the pros are lower monthly cost. They do not specifically have a network. There's coverage doesn't change, you know, between your, your contracts. The cons are that they have a lifetime cap often. They're not technically insurance. And there are exclusions as well as prepaying. So let me talk a little bit more about health sharing ministries in general. So that's things like MediShare, Liberty HealthShare are the two most common that I hear on the more religious side. And then Sidera is another one that I hear more on the non-religious side. And on my website, which is fihealthcare.com, if you go in the knowledge base, I outline all of the pros and cons. And so if you really end up thinking about those, I really would like you to take a look at all those. Later on in the talk, I'll, I'll tell you how to get into my knowledge base so you can take a look at this. So this, is, this may seem obvious, but going on a spouse's plan is what a lot of travel nurses do um, because a lot of folks are married. You know, certainly this isn't the case for everybody. And sometimes the cost of their health care may not be great on the spouse's plan, but it may make sense so that you can have the portability. So the pros are that it can be favorable because the employers usually cover the cost uh, at least somewhat. It may be flexible, but you'll have to check with your plan. And the cons are that it may not have the same coverage outside of your state. So again, check with your plan, but this is an option that I see for a lot of folks. But again, it isn't for everybody. You know, not everybody's eligible. Okay, so now we'll talk about coverage between contracts. This is what a lot of folks want to know. So one of the things that you can do, of course, I'm going to state the obvious, is start a new contract that offers health care, health insurance, and see when their eligibility date is. Is it data? If you're starting with a new company, is it data hire? Um, if you're staying with the same company, how long do you have between them? The other option is the website that I mentioned. It's totally free, uh, fihealthcare.com. That's the website I'm the founder of. I call it my um, the worst business plan in the world because I charge nothing for it. I pay an assistant to do it for me. It's a passion project. So you go into the knowledge base, you enter the password community, and it'll pull up all the options. So again, that's the, the nation's largest crowdsourced database. So it's thousands of people have helped me build this. It's really sort of a huge list of the DIY options. Um, so health sharing ministries are also an option for kind of a layer of support between contracts for those who are interested in it and can qualify. And then COBRA. COBRA is the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, which is just a bunch of words for keeping your existing coverage. So your health insurance that you have, you're entitled to keep it, uh, in most cases, 18 months and sometimes a little bit longer, as long as you pick up the cost that the employer pays. So if you pay whatever premiums you were paying, you start paying whatever the employer was paying, and usually like a 2% administrative fee, then you can keep your existing coverage, which in some cases for travel nurses is a really good fit.
So I dig deep here into Cobra because I saw lots of questions in the, the, the pre-questions that we had. And I know that's a huge question for a lot of travel nurses. So here I have some of the details for Cobra, also how to contact Cobra directly. And as I said, 18 months, here's the map behind what I just said, your, your, impre your premiums, your employer premiums, and then a 2%. Um, here's some estimates of what, what I've often seen. Uh, the pros are that you get to keep your employer's plan. So if you've already met your deductible, that could be a good thing. It can be backdated and I have a timeline for you coming up. You have 60 days to enroll. And if you enroll, you'll need to pay your back premiums, of course, but you do have a little time to figure it out. And there are some recent COBRA changes. I didn't put them in the slide because I want this presentation to be more timeless, but there's a lot of legislation changing about this stuff right now. And COBRA has allowed for some folks to have free premiums through September 30th right now is the, the information I have. Megan can hop in if she disagrees with that. We also have general open enrollment um, for a marketplace plan, which is just when you go to healthcare.gov. That is, I think, until August 15th this year, 2021. But back to Cobra, if you, Megan unmuted, do you have anything to, to add or clarify? Yeah, I definitely would. So um, yes, if you, in terms of the free or subsidized COBRA premium um, through September 30th, um, that was an update uh, uh, handed down through ARPA. Um, so if you are looking at your uh, COBRA vendor site, you do want to learn more about ARPA, you can search whichever vendor um, you're currently with. Uh, it is for involuntary terminations only. So if you're ending an assignment, it's of your choice. Um, this subsidy wouldn't be applicable for you. Um, but if you were involuntarily terminated for any reason, um, you would have um, uh, access to this type of subsidy. Megan, does it also uh, apply for folks who have had reduced hours? It does, as long as the reduced hours were also uh, involuntarily made. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, that would make sense. Perfect, thank you. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, I see somebody in chat said that they contacted Cobra and made her, the rate made Adrian's head explode. Yeah, the, it is really interesting or frustrating to find out what your actual rate is without employer help uh, because usually employers cover like 84% of the cost. So when you see the full cost of your health plan, it's really can be startling and so that's why I definitely recommend if you're thinking about COBRA to take a look and get the estimates of what it will actually be for you. So, okay, please call, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at comments. I, I'm seeing a little something about um, Megan's audio. I do hear Megan's audio. Are you guys able to hear my audio fine? Is it just Megan's occasionally? Thumbs up, okay. All right. If you're any audio issues issues on my end, just a little side note. Um, if you're not hearing one of our speakers, try signing out of the event and logging back on using Chrome. Chrome browser is the most uh, is the most compatible with this platform. Mm, that's that's cool. Great. So here's more about Cobra, and you know, in a lot of cases, this isn't going to make sense, but I do want you guys to know this because I think this can be a good sort of backup, temporary, perhaps short term, because it sort of can catch you if you don't have a better option. So again, I include the, the COBRA office number that you can call directly. I've always found them to be very helpful because I always ask them and Casey and Nicole know I dig deep with my questions. So they're a great resource and things are changing a lot right now in legislation. So here's the timeline. So 14 days after employment ends, uh, you're supposed to be getting a letter sent that offers you COBRA. So I think the 14 day requirement is that when they have to send the letter, not necessarily when you receive it. Um, and then after I go through this, I'll have Megan pop in because she's actually an insurance expert. I'm just an insurance geek nurse. Then 60 days you have to send back to opt in for COBRA coverage. 
So you do have a bit of time to see, do I have another contract going on? It's, it's really great, I think, that they give you time to figure out, do you have a better option first? And then you can backdate. And then 45 days after you opt in. So you have, you know, 14 days and 60 days, but 45 days after you opt in, uh, you have until you make your payment. If you miss your payment, I believe that makes you ineligible um, for COBRA coverage. Megan, do you have anything to add there? I do, um, which probably complicates things a little bit further. So uh, what Lynn is walking you through right now, I would say is our normal pre-pandemic timeline. Um, obviously um, employees and you know people are just experiencing um, uh, different uh, impacts related to COVID. And so the IRS has allowed for additional time periods um, to make elections as well as to submit your premium. Uh, best practice is always to follow these standard timelines um, because eventually the government will decide when the outbreak period is over and they'll revert back to this. Um, but just know that if, if you didn't uh, meet this standard timeline, so the 60 days or the 45 days after election to make payment, um, if you are still interested, strongly encourage you to reach out to that COBRA vendor um, because they will most likely allow for the exception um, while we're uh, within this pandemic. So uh, it's the only other tidbit I'd add there, Lynn. Yeah, that's great. That that mm -hmm. complicates it, but in a good way for all of us. So that's really great. Uh, there's a question in chat that I think maybe, maybe Megan might know. Out of curiosity, does COBRA matter from state to state? Is there any issue regarding coverage moving from location to location? So yes, and that's a pretty uh, big question. So if the employer that you're working for um, qualifies for federal COBRA, then it shouldn't matter. And if the plan that you're on has national coverage, so, so a PPO um, or even an EPO, it shouldn't matter. Um, if you're on an HMO plan, which is a health maintenance organization, usually those types of coverage only offer in-network care. Um, for preventative types of services. Um, emergency care you can always access nationwide. Um, but the good news is if you ever do move, best practice would be to reach out to the COBRA vendor, share that you're moving um, because that could potentially be a qualifying life event if you have some sort of loss of coverage. And they'll be able to help make sure that you move into a plan um, that will still provide access um, and comprehensive coverage for you. Um, I should add, if, if you're working for a travel agency, uh, travel nursing agency potentially um, that is not uh, required to offer federal COBRA, there are state COBRA options as well. So California has state COBRA, New York has state COBRA. And so um, at any point in time, if you are moving to COBRA, um, you do have questions with the current travel nursing agency you're with. Um, definitely just encourage you to reach out to their HR team, their benefits team, um, so that you can understand the specifics of the continuation for your uh, specific plan. Thank you, Megan. And for those of you who don't already know, we're very lucky in that we've negotiated for Megan to stay after and answer some questions specifically on this. So for folks who want to, she'll answer what she can. There will be things that are probably going to be individual specific that she may not be able to, of course. Uh, but that's, we're very fortunate to have been able to set that up. So, all right, Casey. So this is just some random resources that I found. I probably have read a thousand articles. I've talked to hundreds, now thousands of people. And so here are some random, well, not random, they're very well organized resources that other travel nurses have found very helpful while they're traveling, whether you have health insurance or not. And so I wanted you guys to have these. So medication costs, whether you have health insurance or not, sometimes you can get things outside of your insurance and Walmart and actually many companies have a list of low cost generic medications. Managing medication costs is something that's helpful for you, your family, if you have any medications, but also good for you to know for your patients. Um, and so Walmart has a very extensive list of generics and they're all over the country. GoodRx is an app 
that will compare medication costs for all these different areas. So as you're traveling throughout the country and you want to compare medication costs for different um, places, Walmart or Target, sometimes there's a huge disparity in cost. You know, pharmacies can charge all sorts of things. So that is an app that I've gotten feedback from a lot of travel nurses. It's been very, very helpful. And then this is a financial assistance tool I heard from another travel nurse and I really liked it. So if you have a specific condition that's really expensive medications, this medicineassistancetool.org will take you to this list, this comprehensive database of options. So again, this is a resource helpful for travel nurses, your families, if you guys have specific conditions that might be expensive to manage and or your patients. Okay, there, and this is virtual care, and I'm thrilled that with the pandemic has helped us get a little bit more involved with virtual care. Virtual care is not always going to work great, and there's lots of telehealth type options. The one that I hear most often in the travel community is telecare.com, and there's no insurance needed. You don't have to have any insurance, and you can call them right when you're sick. They are remote, so as long as you have access to Wi-Fi, then you can access them. It might be helpful if you have a high deductible plan and you know you're gonna have to cover the cost anyway. Uh, it has mental health, and we know nurses have higher incidence of depression than the general population, and that was before COVID. So I'm a really big advocate of nurses having access to mental health resources wherever they are. It is 24-7. And you can add your family, so if you're traveling with your family, to access them. I've also heard about Teladoc. Anybody else who's had experience with virtual care, I wouldn't mind if you put it in the chat, if you've used them, if you like them, so we can kind of see. But I love this concept. So here are some of my favorite Facebook groups, because what's going to happen is you're trying to figure out, well, what am I going to do in my specific situation? And luckily, I know the best groups to ask questions. And I really like Gypsy Nurse Network. It's a huge, huge Facebook group. And a lot of nurses that I, I call them spicy. It's, it's pretty entertaining, actually, and really informative. And there's a lot of health insurance and healthcare threads in there. People drop in there who they've used uh, to get health insurance, so they're brokers. And I really, really like it. I think it might be a good resource for, for you folks. I also really like Harnessing Healthcare. And that is a newly started group by this woman I know and adore because she's so good at drilling down to specifics about what do you do about healthcare? What do you do when you're traveling? What do you do? What is COBRA? How does that work? Um, and she's absolutely incredible. I wonder if she's in the audience. She may be, um, Kristen. So yeah, wonderful group. It's not specific for nurses. It's specific for understanding healthcare and it's fantastic. I also really like the group Women's Personal Finance, also called Women on Fire, which stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. I'm part of a group that we were big fans of having the option to work or not work. And it seems crazy, but there's a lot of folks that are in their 20s and 30s who've designed a life that's work optional. And so it's a really group, smart, really smart group of women who talk about all sorts of things related to finance and healthcare comes up quite a bit. And then of course, Trusted Health has a Facebook group. And I just saw, um, you know, a lot of our folks that work for Trusted are on there monitoring and doing a great job supporting folks. Oh, it's called The Modern Nurse. Thanks, Casey. Um, yes, so that's also a great resource in general. Okay, so here's what I think you should do in general. So decide if you want to go with an agency or if you want to try to DIY or do some sort of alternative. So we talked about the pros and cons of both of that. And then once you decide that, kind of figure out what you want to do, what you will do between contracts. Will that be COBRA? Will that be, do you have a spouse? You can be on their plan. Do you, um, are you willing to try a health sharing ministry? What are the different options that you'd like to do? And again, I'm going to say this a million times, but health sharing ministries, so many pros, 
so many comps. John Oliver just did a, a skit on that. Did anybody see that? Drop it in the comments. It was scathing of health sharing ministries. And I, I have such mixed feelings about it. Yeah. Uh, Casey saw it because there's so many pros and so many cons. So again, I'd love it if you guys are really considering health sharing ministries to go on my site and look at all the cons and the pros before you actually sign up for one. Yeah, it's, it's entertaining and, and scathing, but what was great is that he brought up a bunch of cons and I had already listed all of them uh, just because I'd talked to so many folks about this. So decide what you'll do between contracts, plan for costs in your budget, and also in negotiations. So if your travel agency is not paying for your health care, there may be times where you may be able to negotiate um, a cost or a raise or some other benefit because you're costing them less in other ways. So sometimes that's possible, sometimes it's not. Uh, so, so it's important. Is there a link? Okay. And then join Facebook groups. So that is tremendously important to have the amount of support around you because each person's situation is going to be individual. The healthcare landscape is tremendously dynamic and that's going to be really, really important. One, one other thing that I should mention is that the general plan for if you want to get health insurance um, outside of traditional employment, if you want to look at your own health insurance for your state, and I know that you're going to be traveling, so this is a little bit tricky, but I really like what they recommend is healthcare.gov. That's the government site, and that's fine. But what I like really is Health Sherpa. And if anybody's used Health Sherpa, I'd love to know your experience. If you go to Health Sherpa and you type in your zip code and you type in how much you earn in a year, then you'll be able to see what the plans are for your area. But if you do that, I want to make sure that you are looking to see what are the options if you travel outside of your state. And you'll have to dig into that because the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, does not do well at covering things that are not emergencies. So that's one of the reasons why it can be a little trickier as a travel nurse to kind of find it on your own without using a broker to help you because the ACA really um, has been great in a lot of ways, but the, for the travel community, unless you have an emergency, the coverage is not always great. There's a question about when you enter your income, do you only enter taxable income? I think they say annual income, so I don't know that they specify taxable or not taxable. So I think you could use your judgment. What they're probably wanting is your AGI, your adjusted gross income. All right, and now I left a, an extensive period of time for questions because I, I do these kind of talks a lot and there's always a lot, a lot of questions, or I shouldn't say always, but often there is. So I wanted to allow time for that. And I wasn't able to track all the questions as we went through and presented. So if you saw any Casey that I missed, we could start with that, but please feel free to drop in the box and Megan can join me when it starts to get real COBRA specific or real insurance specific. Absolutely. So Lynn, and I realized I didn't start the uh, Q&A when I was telling people where to find it. So that is my fault. I take full responsibility. Mm. But if you look over on the right hand side, you're going to go up to Q&A and click on that. And that's where the questions are. So I can read those out to you so you don't feel like you're talking to yourself a little bit. But um, I'm just going to say that if there's any questions specific to trusted in particular, then I'll, we will leave that for Megan to answer uh, a little bit later on. Like I said, we'll, we'll cover more of the general questions right now for Lynn. Um, but we'll go ahead and start with Mr. Daniel. Um, is there a minimum number of hours or assignments that is needed to be on a travel agency's plan? Hmm. I may, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm what makes logical sense and maybe Megan can can answer this but what makes logical sense to me is they would want you to work close to full time which is usually considered 32 hours a week or more but i'd love to hear megan's thoughts yeah i can definitely chime in and um so trusted specifically has a 30 hour minimum and so that's the number of hours you would need to work each week 
to be considered benefits eligible. Um, that is what I typically see across most employers, um, especially employers that have more than 100 employees in total. Um, but that being said, it is best just to check in with the agency that you are considering. Um, it is a really common question, especially during the recruitment process. Uh, so don't be shy at asking for asking those types of questions. Uh, definitely important for you to understand how the benefits work before taking an assignment. Yeah, and Megan, just to add to that, what if a what if an assignment shift is canceled and or um, will that decrease the amount because it's due to no fault of their their own? Will that yeah. decrease eligibility? Yeah, so that actually depends. Um, if the assignment was decreased before you initially started, then it could delay your benefits eligibility date. Um, if that decrease occurred while you were currently working, so maybe you were working over 30 hours for a few weeks and then that decreased to under 30 hours, um, it would be based on the company's policy to moving you to part-time and if benefits are extended to part-time employees or not. Uh, potentially, if you're moved to part-time and there are no benefit extensions, um, you would always be offered COBRA coverage as well. And like we mentioned earlier, uh, for involuntary reductions in hours, you do have some subsidies provided by the government at this time. Um, but that is also a pretty specific question. So um, if, if you are coming up on that type of scenario, definitely work with your um, benefits contact at whatever travel agency you're going to, travel nursing agency. Absolutely. And just to kind of give my perspective, I did probably about eight assignments um, as travel nurse. Most companies that I worked with offered first day insurance or maybe uh, the, I, sometimes it was the first day of the month insurance. So when, depending on when you started, on your contract, um, it'd be the first day of the month uh, the, after starting your contract. So, but with trusted, I know it's first day, which is fantastic. Um, and then to follow up on that, just to make sure that uh, we can kind of close the loop here. There's another question related to that. Um, if it's 30 hours per week, is there a minimum number of weeks that is needed per year or assignment? I've never seen a minimum number of weeks, but Megan, you might, yeah, okay. So it is based on weekly hours, so no, no minimum. Okay, awesome. Perfect. Um, there's two I feel like we can kind of knock out in uh, one question. Is preventative care um, and pharmacy coverage um, usually offered when taking the agency's insurance? Is preventative care and coverage? Is that the yeah. question? Are they both covered when taking yeah. what Yeah. What I can tell you in working with lots of people is anecdotally, usually preventative care is on most plans. That was part of the ACA. So the Affordable Care Act has 10 major components that it asked for for plans. And now there are some plans that are considered ACA non-compliant, but most plans will cover preventative care that I've seen. Um, and also some pharmacy coverage, but it won't always be the medications that you're necessarily on. So that's something that I would definitely check on, especially if it's a more expensive medication. And we used to, I think Health Sherpa still has it, but there are sometimes um, aggregators that'll tell you what plans outside of a, of a nursing agency tell you what sort of plans cover what medications as well. But I'd like to also see what Megan has to say about trusted sources. Sure. Or yeah. Yeah, I would love to. Um, so uh, preventative care is absolutely covered at 100% on trusted plans, um, as well as pharmacy options. Um, so depending on if you're enrolled in a high deductible health plan, you may pay the full cost of the medication until you reach that deductible. Um, or if you choose one of the PPO options, um, there are co-pays for those types of coverage. So um, kind of best practice across the board. If you are transitioning companies and you are on a medication you know is um, pretty expensive, um, definitely let your uh, medical provider know that you're transitioning coverage because many times carriers require what they call pre-authorizations for certain types of medications. And so a great way to avoid um, maybe, maybe hitting costs 
um, is to get that pre-authorization in early uh, so that you know it's covered and you can make payments based on how your medical plan is structured rather than paying for the full cost. So wanted to add that in as well. It's something I've learned over the years, it's really beneficial. So definitely keep your primary care provider updated uh, as you make changes and you know, don't be afraid to reach out to the carriers as well to make sure that um, you have your ducks in a row. Uh, if you do have a more expensive prescription drug that you're taking. Absolutely. I was actually just talking to our community ambassadors and we we're talking about all the adulting things people need to know before going into travel nursing. And that was one of the topics. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things logistically that it's nice to have your ducks in a row before you leave for your assignment, for sure. And that's definitely one of them. Um, let's see. Uh, Sarah Cross asked, is it possible to ask companies how much they pay for our insurance to gauge how much our cost will be? Can you say that again? I missed a little of the audio. Yeah, I think there's a motorcycle outside my apartment. <laughs> Y'all can hear that or not. Um, is it possible to ask companies how much they pay for our insurance to gauge how much our cost will be? I think you, my opinion is you can ask them. I think it may be difficult to get a straight answer. That's been my experience. You know, it's really interesting when you negotiate things because um, really what makes sense is that the agency wants to get you to work and often it doesn't really matter how much the bottom line is. You know, like when you buy a car, sometimes there's these things that you care about and things that you don't care about. The same with starting with any agency. And if you can negotiate, there's certain elements that you don't need and certain elements you do, that um, a lot of it can be negotiated. And you should certainly ask. I think anybody who's in HR is used to being asked these questions. And I think they're very reasonable because you're trying to figure out, does this make sense? Um, is this something that's gonna work for my family? So I really encourage folks to ask and to advocate and to ask those questions and they may or may not answer them but I think it's worth asking. Do you have anything to add there, Megan, as far as um, trusted and our policies with it? Yeah, I do think um, knowing what benefit, what the benefits are available is very important, a part of the um, recruitment process. Um, I'm not as familiar with what trusted uh, provides to potential recruits, um, but there are really great benefit guides available. So definitely encourage you to ask. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. perfect. And I want to go ahead, Casey. Oh, you're muted. I said, I know Zach, our HR representative here at Trusted, is going to be joining us in just a few minutes. So I can, we can ask him that again later too, kind of what information Trusted it can provide up front. Um, well, great timing, Casey, because I connected with Zach to ask him what exactly I can share. And I have the sheet. Um, and and basically, I'm just going to give you an overview. I didn't put it in the slides because we have to be careful and things change so often. But um, trusted benefits tend to range from a deductible of zero to 450 or 4,500. And then the premium for the employee only is going to be a weekly premium that ranges from 43 to about 112 per week. But that's really in alignment with my slides that I already said that most agencies offer. Um, so it's not, it's, it's really within alignment of that. And uh, they have a dental PPO and a vision PPO. So, and people are going to want to know about spouse coverage and children coverage. I asked him about that. They do offer that, but the, but it doesn't seem that trusted um, supplements the cost. So you would pretty much have to take on the cost of that. Oh, there's Zach. And that's about the extent of what I feel comfortable talking about anyway. So that's perfect. Hi, Zach. Hey, uh, yeah, happy to uh, to answer that, talk a little bit about it. We are, you know, if you reach out to your, from a trusted perspective, at least your nurse advocate or a care team, um, they'll direct questions to us in HR and, and we will share, you know, we, we try to be as transparent as possible. Um, and like Lynn said, things do change. So that's why you don't see in really any agency have, or any company have rates posted anywhere. Um, but if you're considering trusted, we're, we're happy to share that with you and talk through benefits and even help connect, um, you know, even with Sequoia to make sure that certain things are covered under our benefits if, if you're if you're considering that too. So 
yeah, we try to be as transparent as possible and, and happy to answer any questions about benefits that you may have. Thanks so much, Zach. I know I wasn't planning on having you hop on this early, but I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was going to the question separate, but it's so hard because everyone wants to know both at the same time, right? Um, yeah. And I am um, really quickly too, I would just add um, in terms of spouse independence, um, Trusted does uh, contribute for every tier. Um, so there is a dollar amount associated with um, each tier of enrollment, um, which it sounds like Zach's happy to share. Um, so I did want to just kind of add that little tidbit as well, since I saw it come through the chat. Yeah, to just to comment on that based off of what Lynn and Megan are both saying. So Trusted contributes, um, you know, a flat dollar amount for the employer coverage at every tier. Um, it's the same dollar amount no matter what tier you're on. That is strictly for uh, the employer costs. So you would be um, subsidizing the rest of that yourself for uh, dependent and spousing for, um, coverage. But uh, Trusted, no matter what plan you pick, uh, we do contribute towards that for your cost. Okay, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I think that I saw the question actually, do agencies pay for spouse health insurance with pre-existing conditions? So it sounds like Trusted does contribute. Uh, Lynn, do you have anything for other agencies? I, I'm not quite sure if there's a, do you have any yeah. data on that? This is, this is in alignment with what I've seen from other agencies. They, um, yeah, I love that they, I get reached out by recruiters all the time. So I have existing relationships with them. So I was able to get probably more information than most might, but um, the rates that Trusted offers are really in alignment with what I'm seeing um, na nationally. So it seems fairly consistent. Okay, awesome. Um, I have I have a question, and this is this is more for you, Lynn, because um, you might have seen this with other agencies. Dorothy asked, one of my agencies paid me a small hourly health and wellness benefit when I did not opt for their insurance. How common is it for an agency to pay the employee an amount when the employee has outside insurance? I did not see that as a travel nurse ever. So I'm curious to see if you've seen that. Well, I think that it's smart to negotiate that because if you're not, if, if the travel agency isn't having to pay insurance for you and, and Megan and Zach can tell us if that's true or not, that's a, it's a pretty good expense for them. And so you can, uh, that's probably what they do maybe to entice folks um, but it's also kind of a fair thing to do and part of something that I think can be negotiated. So I don't know that that's super common. Maybe it, the thing with travel nursing is you, you have your wages and you have all these benefits and it can be packaged in all these different ways, but really it's, it's really, um, essentially the same thing. So some agencies may add it to your hourly rate, for example. And some agencies may add it to a travel stipend. And some of that's pre-tax and some of that's post-tax, but I think it comes packaged in a different way. And I, what I like about Trusted is that it's more transparent, I think, than most agencies, as far as there's not a lot of fluff offered. At least this is my impression, and Megan and Zach um, and Casey can also speak to this, but it's a, more of a flat rate and fewer stipend type thing. So you have a clear view of what you're actually getting. Have you found that to be the case? Are you asking me, Lynn? For anybody who, from the inside of Trusted, this is a, an observer's point of view. Yeah, from, from a perspective, as far as paying, if you don't take benefits, that's more, Megan, correct me if I'm wrong, more of like a high level plan option. It's not necessarily something that can be negotiated on a one off. Um, and that's not something at this time that Trusted does. We do look, uh, we work with Megan every year to, you know, renew our benefits and see what's out there, what's in the best interest of our nurses. So um, something for us to look into. But um, as far as benefits are completely separate um, from your pay packages, we want to make sure that, like Lynn said, everything's super transparent. You know exactly what you're getting up front. Um, and then benefits is something on the side of that. You know, if you want to enroll in that, that's not going to impact your pay package or anything like that, uh, stipends, it's just going to be something that comes out of your um, your uh, your pay on an hourly basis, uh, or on a weekly basis based on your hourly pay. Um, so we, we remove that from stipends or anything like that, so it's super clear. Yeah, and the only other thing I would add too is, um, so that type of situation is called a waiver credit. And so if you're waiving 
medical, dental, and vision. Um, some companies may extend some sort of credit um, to your pay, um, but I would say overall that's more of a benefits philosophy um, that organizations usually have. Um, I know certain organizations don't like to incentivize people to waive benefits. They want to make sure employees are enrolling in coverage if they do need it. Um, but like Zach said, you know, we're always happy to re-review uh, what else is out in the market, especially if other travel nursing companies are doing it. Um, so we can pull in that benchmarking data and assess if, if improvements need to be made. So really great question. We appreciate it. You know, keep them coming. Thanks, Megan and Zach. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. So I'm trying to look at the questions that have been upvoted. It, um, Dorothy asked, I recently chose a short term medical insurance plan in order to be covered in all states. What should travel nurses be aware of with short term plans? Yeah, so I have, I'm actually referencing my own knowledge base right now. Um, I have a whole section on short term plans and I have the pros and cons. So if you want to take a look, um, you can absolutely do that. I gave away the password as community. I, I give it away uh, at the entry, but a lot of people don't read that. And short term plans are have the pros and cons they're they're meant to so it's option number four in my knowledge base they're meant to really be short term and so they're they have a lot less coverage so the pros are the premiums tend to be lo lower um, the cons are that they don't they don't usually have to comply with those ACA requirements which are those 10 provisions like mental health care um, etc and they may or may not have the pre-existing conditions clause, but if you already have that, that's not been an issue for you. Usually it's not an option for longer than one to three years and it's not available in many states. So I would think as, and I have some links here, I'm looking over here because I'm looking at my knowledge base. Uh, one of the things that I would look at is finding out if that plan, how well it travels and if there's anything that you need to know. Um, I have some links in the knowledge base about how to find plans if anybody is interested in that. But I really think the biggest caution is that, you know, look to see what exclusions are. Because if a plan is cheaper, then there's probably a reason it costs less. Um, and so to take a, a look at that. I have a little summary here about short-term plans. They're a trade-off to consumers. It's lower premiums in exchange for more limited coverage. And the Kaiser Foundation estimates that short-term plans provide coverage with fewer benefits at 54% lower than ACA compliant plans. And the bulk of the premium savings is from excluding people with pre-existing conditions and also for holding people in short-term. So there's that about short-term plans. Thanks, Lynn. And I'll make sure that we send out these resources in our email but with the recording of the event so that you guys have them and can easily access them. Um, I see that there's a couple questions about brokers, insurance brokers. Mm -hmm. um, how do you trust them? Uh, what do you look for in a broker regarding assistance with insurance? Um, and also to clarify, we should be ensuring that our selected plan covers state to state. Yeah. It's really I, yeah, I expected the question about brokers. So Casey, if you advance two slides, I have the questions that I think you should ask brokers. Oh, perfect. I didn't realize you had it on here. I just popped it in because I was expecting. Look oh. at <laughs> so nice. yeah, these are the things I recommend that you ask. So first of all, the way to find a broker, um, the best way that I found is to crowdsource from people you know and trust. That's the best way. I've talked to a lot of brokers. I haven't found a great platform for screening them. But these are the questions that I would ask. Um, I would ask around to, or ask around on those Facebook groups that I mentioned. But what state are you licensed? Which health insurance companies do you broker? Is this a nationwide plan? Does this meet the ACA criteria? And if not, what are the differences? As we've seen, the ACA non-compliant tend to be less expensive in exchange for not having some of the benefits. 
What's the premium deductible and out of pocket? And is there anything else? And then, you know, you're a nurse. You're, you guys are nurses. You're great judges of character. Watch how they respond to these. Are they shifty? Are they, you know, um, how do they do with these questions? And then go from there. So that's what I, I recommend when you're looking for a broker. Awesome. Yeah, I actually used one for uh, my last year and a half, I think. Um, it wasn't great insurance, honestly, because I was healthy and I just chose, I think, the, what is it called? Catastrophic insurance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, but it was, I found them through a friend and that's, uh, that's uh, the word of mouth. So I can kind of reinforce that at least. Um, let's see. So Christina asked, this is a little bit longer. So um, I was injured on one of my days off and the hospital canceled my contract. I lost my income and health insurance that day. Full-time staff has short-term disability and FMLA. Is there anything out there for travel nurses that can help with loss of income when something like this happens? This actually happened to one of my friends while we were traveling. She broke her foot and the hospital wouldn't let her come to work with the shoe on because she worked in the NICU. So uh, she luckily had short-term uh, disability insurance, but this does happen more often than we think. So um, the question about the healthcare aspect of that, if you lose your role um, because of a qualifying event, and in this case, she's not able to physically work, she could qualify by looking at, you know, healthcare.gov to see what, what insurance options would be available. And, and if she's lost income, it may be subsidized at part of that cost um, because loss of income, loss of job may be considered the qualifying event. Um, as far as how to actually earn income when you're not physically able to, was that part of the question or was it more about insurance coverage? Um, it's also if there's anything out there that can help with the loss of income when something like that happens. Mm. I'm happy to chime in too, Lynn. Please, please okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so disability insurance uh in my opinion is definitely the most important type of insurance outside of medical um because the way you want to think about it is if i were to lose my income how would i continue to pay for you know my my monthly expenses so my mortgage my car insurance those um, ongoing health bills and so um depending on what state you're in you may already have state-sponsored short-term disability insurance and so as you're thinking about working with a broker, they will be able to educate you on what you're eligible for based on the state that you are working and or living in. Um, right now, Trusted does not provide a short-term or a long-term disability policy, um, but really that is in line with um, kind of the benchmark for your type of industry, because it would be really hard to provide this type of benefit um, for contracts that are so short. And so in order to qualify for disability insurance, you do have to have um, a loss of income. Um, so there's a little bit more complexities around offering this with the type of um, contracts that you're currently taking on. So probably why it's not as common. Um, so I definitely recommend working with that broker on an individual disability plan. Um, because it's on an individual level, uh, they will price and rate you based on the age you are when you enroll. Um, they will also ask for health questions in order to assess what that cost would be. Uh, so essentially, the younger you are when you purchase it, um, the lower premium you're going to have and the easier um, you'll be able to get coverage. Uh, there are two types of disability. So we talked a little bit about short term. Um, that usually at most lasts for 52 weeks, so for about a year. But if you have more of a catastrophic injury accident diagnosis where you need to be out longer past a year, that's when you would also want to have long-term disability insurance. And so when you are working with a broker to look for individual types of plans, uh, it's super important to understand the length of the benefit period in which you're enrolling for and what's covered. Um, so I know in general, um, in the nursing field, there are a lot of women, mothers out there. And so uh, many times short-term disability can be used as a replacement for when you are on maternity as well. So that's also best practice when reviewing your plans, um, calling out to making sure that uh, maternity coverage is available and how long the benefit duration would last um, specific to maternity. 
so I know I shared a lot of information. I, I think I maybe word vomited a little bit, but um, you know, disability is a really great benefit, um, especially if you're changing employers frequently. Um, I strongly recommend getting an individual policy uh, so you feel protected if something were to happen. That's awesome. This is the first time I've heard a lot of that information regarding short, short uh, term disability. And I wish I would have known that when I was a travel nurse. So that's amazing. Thank you for that, Megan. Yeah, absolutely. So it looks like we're right at the hour mark. So I want to switch over and make sure we gave um, everyone in this time to ask questions specifically about trusted. Now, Megan, did you want to share slides? Um, okay. Yeah. Just, um, let me see. Uh, so, um, I'm going to give a huge shout out to Lynn for hosting this first section, and I really appreciate it, Lynn. That was great information, and I really um, appreciate the time and effort you spent researching all that, too, as well. Um, her information's right up here. I'm going to send out the slides with the recording after the event, so if you want to reach out to her, all of her information's right here. Um, but thank you so much, Lynn. Is there anything else you wanted to add? I know you'll probably stick around for the other questions, but just yeah, to Yeah, I'll stick around and get another cup of coffee. Um, even though it's poor at night, <laughs> but yeah, I just am grateful you guys uh, came, you spent your time, the replay will be available because I know that healthcare and health insurance is a lot to mentally metabolize. So I just appreciate, and I appreciate Megan and Zach and Casey a lot for supplementing because I'm not, I knew that I would not be able to deep dive into the aspects that HR and benefits coordinators do because it's from a a nurse perspective who deep dives into this, but certainly not all experts. So thank you all. I'm gonna turn video off and we'll switch over to Megan. Perfect, thank you so much, Lynn. Um, I think both perspectives are equally as important. So thank you. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna stop sharing, Megan, and I'm gonna toss it over to you and let you share. All right, let me know when you can see the screen. All right, perfect. So um, I did put together a few slides uh, in terms of uh, Trusted Health's benefits resources. Um, so I'll make sure to go through these pretty quickly um, so that we can save enough time uh, for questions at the end. I did see a couple more come through the chat. Um, but really, if you are taking a contract with Trusted or maybe you're already an, an employee and you're on some plans, um, just know that, um, you know, Sequoia Consulting, as we work directly with Zach and his team on creating these benefits packages, we also want to help support you and your family members directly. And so there's a number of different resources available to you once you are enrolled on these plans, um, either beforehand or after to help uh, you navigate uh, through the insurance benefit programs. And so this slide is an overview of uh, all of those resources that I'm gonna walk you through a little bit here today. And so first, uh, directly through Sequoia, you do have access to a mobile app. Um, so if you are on contract with Trusted, you can actually just search Sequoia Mobile in your app store today and download the app for free. Uh, essentially, once you log in with your uh, email address that's listed in ADP, uh, you'll be able to see real-time information about all of your benefits programs. Uh, probably the most important feature about the app is visibility for your member ID information. And so where we're at currently with Aetna, you will have to uh, add in your member ID information once you've logged in, uh, but we are going through a couple technical updates and in the next few months that will actually pull through in real time. So no manual uh, data entry necessary. Uh, that essentially means for you that as you go into your primary care uh, doctor's office, um, as you go into the emergency room, your dental, your vision, uh, you'll have all the information at your fingertips on this app um, so that you can communicate and get, uh, you know, any services you're looking to see um, effectively and efficiently. Uh, in addition to the mobile app, uh, you also have the ability to see your benefit booklets by visiting login.sequoia.com. Uh, also logging in with the email address you have listed in ADP to see all of your benefit plan information. Um, so that includes uh, benefit summaries, uh, a really great comparison tool, um, some of the well-being programs that I know we didn't talk about today that are still really great 
benefits to help support you with your mental health, your physical fitness, things like that. Um, and then this site also contains uh, what your monthly premium would be. So if you're curious what your contribution would be across any tier, or any coverage, that is all visible and transparent uh, within the website as well. Uh, outside of these two programs, you also have access to ADP. So that is the system that you would make any of your benefit election changes in. Uh, the carrier resources site, strongly encourage you to at any point, especially if you are traveling on the go, um, to maybe look into downloading the carrier resources apps as well. So I know Aetna has a really great app that allows you to um, see all information related to your claims activity, your SBCs, how much of the deductible you've met throughout the year so you can stay on track um, and understand the actual cost. Um, they also have a really great cost uh, calculator tool as well. So if you are going in for a service, you want to plug it into their calculator tool to understand what the out-of-pocket cost will be for you based on the plan you're enrolled in, um, you can do so through Aetna's portal. Uh, you all met Zach today, maybe you've met him before, but your Trusted Health People team is also always available to answer any benefits question. Um, so you can reach them at hello at trustedhealth.com. Um, and then last but not least, in addition to the products Sequoia provides to all of our clients' employees, uh, you also have a dedicated Sequoia advocate. So just like I support Zach and team, you actually have access to benefit experts uh, directly um, that can answer any of your benefits questions. So I have a slide with more information on that that I'll, I'll touch in on in a minute. Again, uh, this is the mobile site that gives you unlimited information around your benefits and has some really great uh, plan comparison tools. This is a, a, another slide on that uh, company benefits site, so that electronic booklet that has all of your plan details included with information on how to enroll. Uh, the employee advocate team, so I didn't dive into this too much, but um, at any point in time, either before you're enrolling, um, you know, if you are traveling and seeing a doctor, you just have questions about coverage, um, in-network, out-of-network costs, or potentially if you received a bill that you don't necessarily agree with, um, we want you to reach out to us and let us know how we can help support you directly. Um, so you can call us uh, during regular business hours, which are 8.30 to 5 p.m. Pacific, Monday through Friday, or at any point you can shoot us over an email with whatever questions you have. Um, I will say the average uh, response time is about two to three hours, um, and we try to get all uh, requests responded to over email within 24 hours. Information about how to find in-network providers, always super important across your medical, dental, or your vision insurance. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but it is available uh, within your company benefits site and internally with Trusted's programs. Um, Teladoc, I know Lynn talked a little bit about virtual healthcare options earlier. Uh, so great news uh, through the Trusted plans. You do have that uh, virtual assistance available as well. Uh, mail order prescription drugs. So we talked a little bit about best practices around uh, the cost of Rx especially when you're transitioning um, you know, companies. Uh, so mail order prescriptions is a way to uh, typically allow for you to get a larger supply at a lower cost. And so if you're ever considering mail order prescriptions, you're just gonna let your um, medical provider know that you're interested so that they can submit the script for you in a way um, that allows for mail order to happen. Now, if you're changing uh, travel nursing companies and you have a mail order prescription in place, definitely make sure to get that updated with the new carrier. Um, so if that's trusted, it's gonna be Aetna's carrier. If it's another company, uh, best practice is just to let your uh, physician know that you're changing medical plans and they need to resubmit for your mail order prescription. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, Trusted also has this app through Aetna. I know I talked a little bit about it uh, earlier in the conversation, but this is just a reminder slide with more information specific to what's available in the app, um, including information around COVID-19 uh, testing and resources uh, if you need additional support with that. 
So I know I ran through those pretty quickly. Um, I didn't want to bore you if you are not currently a trusted employee, and this deck is available internally for you to access at a later time. Um, so I'd love to transition to questions right now if that works for you, Casey. Absolutely. So um, looking in the Q&A, uh, I see one specific to trusted, so we'll start with that one. Uh, Joshua asked, with trusted, how easy is it to add or drop vision or dental or make changes to benefits between contracts? So if you are between contracts, so you have wrapped up one contract and then you're moving to another contract, I guess uh, it would depend on if there was a time period. I guess I know, Zach, you came off mute. If an employee goes from a 13-week contract and it gets extended, are they treated like new hires or do their benefits roll over? Yeah, so we have a couple different, depending on the scenarios. Um, so if you just sign an extension at your current assignment and there's no, well, no, you just sign an extension, um, you can make changes to your benefits at any time. That essentially for us is a qualifying life event. Um, so you can make those changes then. If you're between contracts, um, you can make changes, like if you have another contract coming up, you'll, be able, you'll receive essentially notification from Trusted letting you know that, hey, your next contract starting, uh, please log into ADP and make any changes uh, that you would like to your benefit. So anytime you change contracts, you can make whatever changes you want. Uh, and that includes adding, dropping coverage, adding dependents, dropping dependents. Uh, so very flexible. We try to make it as flexible as possible, including that um, qualifying life event. If you sign an extension, we do allow you to make changes at that time too. Great. Um, make sure I didn't miss any in the other chat. Um, Morgan asked, in between contracts, is the best way to go with healthcare.gov or stay with existing plan from agency through COBRA? Do you, either of you have any insight there? I think it just varies on um, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, so if you are moving to COBRA, you are going to maintain the same coverage. Um, you are also going to have the same uh, deductible and out-of-pocket accumulators. Um, so if you're within a contract period where, you know, maybe you've used your benefits a lot and you're all close to that out-of-pocket maximum, even if the premium's higher, it might make more sense to stay with that plan. Um, so that type of question, I would really say, varies um, from situation to situation. Um, but both options are always available and, um, you know, depending on who you typically go to for support. Um, yeah, I guess maybe my question for you, Casey and Lynn, is outside of uh, this training, are there any other types of uh, emails or uh, direction uh, these members who join the call today could reach out to for ongoing questions? Um, well, I think, Lynn, do you have anything? I mean, obviously, I sit in the community team, so I'm by no means an insurance expert. Uh, but I know the groups, the travel groups, would probably be where I would direct them. What about you, Lynn? Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Um, so I would also say harnessing healthcare. I really like that group. That was one of the ones I recommended. And I completely agree with Megan. It's going to depend on case to case, depending on what kind of things you're able to find on healthcare.gov. Have you already met your deductible? And how long do you plan to be without a contract? You know, if it's pretty short, it may make sense to do COBRA for a while, just for so many reasons, including financial ones. Um, but if it's longer, then it may make more sense to look at healthcare.gov. Um, but those specific questions might do well in the harnessing healthcare group. We've got a lot of people who are really into helping people figure out healthcare options. Yeah, I can't think of any other resources to direct someone if they're not on assignment with Trusted, really. Um, and you guys can reach out to me as well. I'm at hello oh. at fihealthcare.com. And um, I, I don't sell insurance. I'm a nurse. Uh, but I may, if you have specific questions, may have resources that I might re recommend for your specific case. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate that. Yeah. Lynn's the best. She's my oh. personal financial mentor. <laughs> and I used to talk about money, you know, try to talk with, with nurses about money for a long time because I started investing now 30 years ago and nobody wanted to talk to me about it until I quit my job and the Wall Street Journal found me. And now people are very interested. I think 
folks don't necessarily want to retire early, but they like the option of having, um, being able to take a year off or, yeah, so managing finances is a good part of it. So anyhow, yeah, the feel free to do that. Lens your girl. Yeah. Um, perfect. There's a couple of Cobra questions here, so might as well just cover those since we're kind of already on the topic of it anyways. Um, if you sign up for Cobra after completing an assignment, but decide to switch to another company, but want to keep your own insurance, can you keep Cobra? So can you extend that if you have an option through another company? Uh, so you can, yes. So if you're current, so in a scenario where you become COBRA eligible, you enroll in COBRA coverage. Um, let's say, you know, you're enrolled on the plan and then um, you're offered a position that has alternative coverage starting your date of hire, um, you may have some overlap. And so that type of um, coverage is called dual coverage when you have more than one uh, providers. Um, what gets a little complicated about having dual coverage um, is that insurance carriers will tend to fight over who is the primary coverage. And so you would just want to be aware of who you're communicating your insurance with. Um, sometimes it works best um, telling your provider that you only have one, um, whichever insurance provider you think should be the primary. That way all the benefits uh, get paid out and then you can submit for your secondary. Um, but there are some complexities with doing that, um, especially since the primary isn't uh, quite as obvious since both coverages are through you. Um, additionally, if you're enrolled on COBRA, um, you're probably paying for uh, the cost of the healthcare insurance. And so um, you would want to weigh the option of paying that um, premium for multiple plans um, and if it's really needed. So uh, this is also a little bit of a complex question because um, I know Lynn talked a little bit earlier about the different types of plans available. So there's um, PPOs, preferred provider organizations, which give you, gives you access um, to nationwide coverage. Uh, you, you can see specialty care on your own. Um, HMO, health maintenance organizations, that gives you access to only in-network providers. Uh, so Kaiser is a really good example if you're familiar with that type of um, health provider. And then um, EPO, it's exclusive provider uh, organization. It's kind of a blend between your HMO and your PPO, where, you sh where they try to force you to stay in network, but you can go out of network for certain types of services. And so depending on what those dual coverage options are, um, you would also want to look at the plan designs to see if it would really even benefit you. Because if you have an HMO on COBRA where you can only go in network, but a PPO on another plan, it may not even benefit you um, to have both of them if your HMO won't pay out for the coverage that you have on the PPO. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about that is uh, certain organizations offer, like Trusted, a high deductible health plan. And in order to be enrolled in a high deductible health plan and contribute to a health savings account, you cannot be enrolled on another type of program that's not considered a high deductible. Um, so you wanna be aware of what programs you're enrolled in um, to avoid potential tax penalties um, if you're choosing plans that don't align um, with some of the benefits that you're being provided with. So that is a really great question. I wish I could answer it more fluidly. Um, it is a little complex. So, um, you know, if you are considering keeping your COBRA coverage while starting with a uh, new plan, um, definitely the, the biggest barrier and uh, complicated situation I've seen arise is around billing. Um, so just be aware of that. Talk with your provider. They see it all the time. They'll be able to help um, help you understand that. Um, and they work with carriers directly frequently enough to know how certain bills should be submitted in a way to where there's not as much conflict. I didn't know that either. I've learned so much tonight from my own perspective. <laughs> I was like, oh, I wish I'd known all these things. Um, perfect. So um, Adrian asked, and you might have covered this, I don't think you've mentioned EPOs, correct? Yeah, yeah, great question, Adrian. So the EPO, you can think of it as a um, mix between an HMO and a PPO. Um, so you will want to stay in network um, with an EPO, um, but in general, you do have some more flexibility than you to going out of network services or procedures. And so um, if when you are starting with a company, if an EPO is offered um, and you 
our fine stain and network only. It's a great offering for you. Um, if you like the flexibility of um, going in and out of network with no restrictions, um, definitely encourage you to, to look more at your PPO option. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Jennifer made a comment, and this might be a little bit more towards the end, but uh, she was looking at insurance options on healthcare.gov and noticed that no one covers metformin. Another thing she noticed is that most plans do not give the option of dental for children. Um, do you have any insight there, Lynn? Yeah, I have. So metformin tends to be fairly inexpensive medication. That is interesting that they would choose not to cover it because it's a very common, but it is an inexpensive. Um, and so if you were, I would recommend GoodRx to see uh, because you don't have coverage um, and hopefully you should find it very reasonably priced, but that that's, is a shame. Um, and as far as dental for younger folks, um, I do see a lot of exclusions for vision and dental. Dental insurance doesn't tend to be super great in my experience. They'll have a cap of like 2000 or 3000 and then they'll only pay 50%. So oftentimes folks are better off private paying unless they know that they've got a big dental plan. But, um, the question was really, why isn't this offered? And, and I don't have a great answer for you. I don't know, Megan or Zach, if you know of dental outside of employers, I think you can, you can private pay and buy your own plan, but I do see ex it excluded quite a lot from a lot of plans. Yeah. So, so I can speak about Trusted's dental program. Um, and so uh, dependent coverage is included. Um, in terms of the annual maximums, uh, dental is interesting. I think the benchmark for company annual maximums is around $1,000. Um, so it's not that rich. Anything above and beyond that is uh, pretty great, honestly. Um, and then the way dental maximums work, it's actually a little counterintuitive because it's the opposite of medical insurance. Uh, so that annual maximum that you see is the most that um, you'll be covered. You'll be covered in any given uh, plan year. Anything above and beyond that maximum, you're, you're typically responsible for at 100% um, outside of preventative care. Um, Dental insurance, I don't know the ins and the outs of what's available um, individually, um, but I do know many times dentists negotiate on care. Um, so you may be able to work with a dentist uh, directly on pricing. Um, just be transparent with them. No, you don't have insurance. Uh, sometimes uh, providers, you know, increase costs on certain procedures because they know and understand what insurance providers will pay. And so if you share that you don't have insurance, they will they could potentially lower the actual cost for you. Um, so I've seen that happen in the past, um, but uh, in terms of uh, Trusted's dental program, um, it's, a, it's a great program, dependents are covered. Um, so sorry to hear that about uh, your 17 year old. <laughs> One other resource I thought of is that Facebook group I recommended, Harnessing Healthcare has several posts about dental so that may be also a great place to cruise around and maybe even ask questions specific to your situation um, for that. And as well as uh, looking at schools, dental schools, if you're okay with that, if there's some dental schools, that's how I had my wisdom teeth taken out when I was young without dental insurance. Um, again, you know, if you're comfortable with it, that can be a resource for reasonably priced dental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a couple other thoughts on that too. I have also gone to a dental school uh, for uh, dental services. Um, with the trusted plans, dependents are allowed to be on the plans through age 26. Um, if your 17 year old is going to start at a university, there may also be um, insurance available through the university. I know when I was in school, I signed up for um, the healthcare insurance provided through San Diego State where I went. Um, and it was super beneficial. It was on site. Um, so there may be alternative options um, in the event that, um, you know, your child goes to some sort of university as well. 